we are discussing biblical principles of success that Paul teaches in Philippians chapter 1. In Philippians chapter 1, he is talking about success or that whatever God begins in you will bring to completion, bring to success. That's in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. And in the process, he teaches us many things that would help us in our pursuit of realizing the mission God has given us. And I think that's a very important thing to, under, to understand. And um, in the process, as like you discuss in part one, we need to understand that success is preceded by insight. You must, you can't just succeed blindly. You need insight. And success is also, if it's godly success, will be followed by radiance to all and sundry. That your success is really going to impact others. We also say that success is possible if you learn to be proactive. Somebody who thinks things in advance. That's what insight is all about. Before entering into something, analyze it. Find out what God is saying about it. We also encourage you to know yourself, assess yourself. Maybe do a sort analysis on yourself. Understand yourself so you know your strength and your weaknesses. And you understand the external environment in which you're operating. And in the process, we are really saying you must live your life for a God-given vision and mission. That it will be not easy to accurately say you are success. You have made a success of your life. If you don't even know what you are supposed to be achieving, you need to know what God has created you for. Because success is not doing better than so and so we said. Success is being fully who God created you to be. Then in part two, we emphasize the fact that for you to really be a, to be a success, you need to learn partnership. Paul talks about partnership or put in bed, more, more current management language, you are, must be a team player, not a lone ranger. We also encourage you to avoid arrival mentality, feeling you have achieved. Paul, in, in the same book of Philippians, talked about uh, forgetting what lies behind. I push on towards the mark. If you start, start, that arrival mentality very early, you will never get the final, final price. Arrival is when God calls you home. In the meanwhile, you must pursue your vision and mission all the days of your life. And then we say, if you truly are a biblical success, you are going to get biblical success, you must be other-centered, not self-centered. Success is not about your bank account. Success is not about uh, winning a beauty pageant. Success is about what kind of impact have you made on God's people to his glory. Then on part three, we said that for you to get a godly success, you need to commit yourself to being ethical. There's no way you can call yourself a success if you are not, you don't have integrity. What are we really saying? What we are really saying is that the end does not justify the means. Even if you can see you have made an impact, what process do you follow? It can't be biblical success if you cut corners, did unethical things, despite all you did. It is not right that you robbed Peter in order to give to Paul. Giving to Paul is good, but only Peter is bad. So you're not a success, we said. We also say that um, you need to be aware that 
to succeed, there will be many barriers. But you can have right perspective or wrong perspective of barriers and challenges. And the right perspective is to see the barrier from God's perspective, not from yours. And in the process, God will teach you how to turn the barrier into a stepping stone towards your success. Then you say that along the way, there will be distractions. Not really barriers, but distractions. Like one Paul had is people talking, talking ill of him. To people, uh, sometimes people being doing things so that they are hurt. But the things they are doing are good themselves. And he says, ah, I will not spend my time worried about the fact that the motives were wrong. The good thing was done. So he, he say, do not get distracted by non-essentials. Concentrate on the price if you really want to be a success. In part four, we want to read verse 21 of Philippians chapter one. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He is introducing something that's very important as a principle. And this principle is about before getting discouraged, think about the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. He is he's alive, but he thinks about death. And the moment he makes his peace with the dead, living becomes much easier. No one will ever enjoy his life if they don't make friends with the dead. I've written a book called The Secret Contentment. And I said one secret is learning how to have a perspective about death. You know, Jesus says that he came to rescue us who are all our lives lived, lived under the fear of death. So you need to come to where you don't live under fear. Why? You start thinking about even if this thing happened, what the very worst that could happen. Look at the worst. If it actually happened, God allowed it to happen. How will I tackle it? That's what happened to the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are before the king. The king doesn't want them to die. He has no problem with them. But a, a scheme has been done to catch them. So, because they continue worshipping, instead of obeying the rule of worshipping an, an idol, they have, to be, they have to be thrown into the fire. So they go for the worst case scenario. What's the worst that can happen to us? We have to be dead. No problem. If we die, we go to God. So they address the king. Respectively, but they, they are clear. And our, the message is very clear. God, our God, is able to rescue us from your hands. But you have actually thought about the worst case scenario. Our God chooses not to help us. Not because he can't help us, but because he has chosen not to help us in this, in this matter. Then, of course, we will go into the fire. We are okay with it. We have made, thought about it, and we are okay with being thrown in the fire. The moment you are thrown in the fire, you gain new courage. You know, or rather, the moment you have thought out and resolved the issues of being thrown in the fire, you get new courage about how you are dealing with the matter. My friend, many people are unable to achieve their mission in life because of fear. What are they going to do to me? What will they say? What will happen to my name? What happens to, our to my children? I think the worst case scenario is you are dead and your children are young. The moment you start thinking about this, you start saying, wait a minute, these are not my children. These are God's children. If God calls me home, he says, I'm the husband of widows and the father of the fatherless. So my children will still have God as their father. And even when I'm alive, I don't actually provide for my children. God uses me to provide for my children. So if he removes me, it's because he has another way of reaching my children. My children will be equally provided. And of course, I have a testimony about that because my father died uh, when, I was, uh, when I was young. 
and it was clear it would be very difficult to go through school, go through high school. In the 1960s, high school was not very expensive, according to looking at the figures today. But it was impossible. The difference between between uh, between a primary school, primary school, we paid 20 shillings per, per term. That means 60 in a year. When you went to invest, when you went to high school, uh, government school, that is, which are the cheaper ones, you paid about 550 shillings per year. So you can see the jump is an impossible jump. So you wonder how, what will happen? But you know something? God provided, not for me, but also for my sister, because we were, we were, we one, one went into high school one year, the, the other one the following year. So we were even two, not one. And my mother was having difficulty paying for one. When it became two, of course, it sounded like impossible. But you know, we all finished. I finished my from one to four, did my A level, went to university, and graduated. Testimony. God can handle the worst case scenario. So you can't fail to do what God needs you to do because you are worried about what to happen to my children? What to happen to my spouse? Even when you are still alive, it's God who provides. It's God who, who, who does whatever he does. He's the one who gives you the, 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 the direction. After all, he says in Deuteronomy, he is he that gives you power to make wealth. Now, once you understand that, this principle of the worst case scenario, deal with it. Think about it. The moment you are clear God can handle the worst case scenario, then the current problem I'm having starts becoming negligible, small. You are able to gain new courage to analyze it, new courage to start dealing with it, new courage, whatever, even if it, you fail, you know it will be okay. You know, fear paralyzes. And fear of death paralyzes very seriously. So my friend, if you want to be a success in life, you must of necessity not fear death. If you fear death, many things will go wrong. Somebody said a coward dies many times. And when you are dying, you are, you are paralyzed. There's nothing you can, you can achieve. The principle of success is don't fear death. Because then you will not be able to achieve what God has set out for you to achieve. Because you are so afraid. They might kill me. Oh, what will happen to me? What will happen to my relatives? Your life must be a life that is lived for your life's purpose 100%, not fears. You know, once you fear and you are paralyzed, you end up doing the wrong thing. You end up compromising so that your values, you are no longer living within your values because of fear. But the moment you don't fear death, you can stick with your integrity, stick with your values. But maybe your problem is not fear of death, it's fear of failure. You, you live life wondering, what about if I failed? You know, no one ever succeeded who never failed. It's normal to fail because people that are going to achieve a lot, that are going to be a great success, who attempt many things. And some of those things they attempt will backfire, will fail. What happens when you fail? You just learn out of it. You learn a lesson out of the failure. And you now go a cleverer person. Failure is a school fees for training you to success. So don't live paralyzed even if you failed. It's okay if you fail. Sometimes it's even speaking in public and you feel, oh, no, that's okay. Even if you make a mess of yourself and that's okay. You have learned something out of it. So whatever it is God has gifted you in, made called you to do, do it. Even if in the process you will fail. Because how will you learn without failure? The fear of failure may not be as bad as the fear of death. 
but it still paralyzes. You know, all you need is to do your part. But are you aware even after you do your part, any project is more than one person. So you can do your part, but somebody else fails. You can do your part, then events beyond your control uh, happen. And it'll still be a failure. My friend, it will be important that you understand failure does not mean you are bad. It doesn't mean you are evil. It doesn't mean you are sinful. It just means at that particular point, if you truly did your best, God did not favor you with success. And there's a reason why he did not favor you. There's some lesson he wants you to learn. There's something he wanted to stop. And because he is your sovereign, you accept <coughs> his decision on the matter. So you're able to again, despite the failure yesterday, today you're working full blast. Because you have looked at what happened, you have learned lessons of it, you now are wiser, you're able to push on. And most people succeed it's because they are able to pull out of their, of their ashes. The truth is, success is only possible when, gives you his, when God gives you his favor. It's not enough. You don't succeed just because you did your best. You don't succeed just because you are gifted. You succeed because God uses your strength, your giftings, in order to accomplish. So the favor of God is always somewhere. He says in his word, he blesses the work of our hands. That means we must work. Then he blesses it. It's God's favor. So when you succeed, you are not, you are not proud. Because you know very well, it was not just your input. God was involved in it. So when you succeed, you give glory to God. Because you know, nothing happens without God's favor. You can fail, then you rise up. And you move on. Because you know there must be something God wanted you to learn out of that failure. So you do not sit there crying, having a pity party. No. You move on. That way, the fear of failure does not paralyze you. Because even if you fail, that's a comma, not a full stop in your life of success. And I think that's uh, very important. So, what are we learning? Always think of the worst case scenario. Don't get paralyzed by a small thing. Ask yourself, what about the worst happened? Then ask yourself after you know the worst, can God handle the worst? Yes. What are the issues if that happened? This and this and this. Is God able to help you of the yes? Now come back to where you are now. If God can handle the worst, he can handle this. And that gives you courage to attempt, despite all the risks involved in something, when you have actually thought about the worst case scenario. Verse 22 of Philippians chapter 1 says, If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with the Christ, which is better by far. What does Paul say? That he looks at his project on earth in the light of heaven. He was conscious that the best thing that can happen to him is heaven, is going to heaven. Everything is seen with an eternity in mind. So you have an eternal perspective. And that eternal perspective is what tells you. People may not think much of the ministry you are undertaking, of the project you are doing. But what does heaven think about it? So you commit yourself to something that doesn't look much. Maybe similar to Mother Teresa, working with people who people have given up on, the society doesn't care much about. But he is there with them and spending all her time with them. That they seek, that's what she chose to be in. Not a big issue. 
But by the time she's getting a Nobel Prize, it is on that kind of matter, caring for the downtrodden. It won't give you fame, but you notice you might give you fame. But your aim is not fame. Your aim is to do what God has shown you. And you do it because it has assessment of heaven, very great value. So this is something you have to decide to be involved in. For you, everything is seen with eternity in mind. And you need to ask yourself, is that true of your life? What you are doing now? Do you just value it for today or do you value it for heaven? Does it matter to you what God thinks about it? Oh, or the answer to, your, to the question on anything, oh, I enjoy it, I like it myself. No, it's not enough that you like it. What does heaven think about it? So anything you do, if you want to have real success, biblical, biblical success, you must always not look at short-term gains, although they are welcome, but look at that long-term impact, the long-term value, heaven's viewpoint. Like the thing you are doing, you are having to make a choice between this and this. Which of the two will give you long-term benefits? Of which of the two would have eternal value? Or you ask yourself another question. How does it help me to make it to heaven? This thing I'm doing, <laughs> will it be a hindrance to my heaven's journey or a help? Like I said of uh, Mother Teresa, the, the point is, I may get nothing out of earth, but heaven will be happy. So, you must ask yourself, how does it help me to make it to heaven? Or ask it differently, how does this make me to serve the God of heaven? And you'll do something because it, is, it will be more pleasing to God than another thing, irrespective of what the people think about it. Because for you, everything you do must have an eternal perspective. Because you look at everything from a godly perspective. And godly perspective, like you have seen before, means asking yourself, what would Jesus do in similar circumstances? What's God's view of this matter? Maybe the, through this, there's nothing much you are getting out of it. As far as all is concerned, as far as your family is concerned, as far as your employer is concerned. But what does God think about it? And if God thinks greatly about it, I'll do it. Even if everyone thinks I'm mad or I don't seem to be wise, I'll do it because heaven and mother. So in the end, you have a success that not only is fruitful and benefits people, but a success that is going to be pleasing in heaven. You may be going through very big temptation currently. Issues. If I decide this, this could harm me for life. If I decide this, I will lose this. Big temptation. But you, all you need is to look at that temptation in the light of heaven. The moment you look at it, you realize it just loses its attraction. Hmm. Maybe it's a woman who is wooing you, and you're already married. And she's beautiful, she's bright, and she's tempting. Until all of a sudden you wake up to, what does that mean for heaven? And she'll no longer be attractive. You just, she just loses her attraction at all. You are able to go through that sexual temptation because you have started looking at the matter. What will be heaven's viewpoint? What's the long-term impact on my life? And because of that, you, you change completely your viewpoint. 
even when the very worst has happened. Or you've gone through a great trial. Now, not a temptation, but a trial. When you look at it in the light of eternity, it starts to grow strangely dim in the light of his grace, like the songwriter says. Somebody says, somebody say, oh, you've gone through a hard time. No, you don't even see it as hard. When you look at it in the light of heaven, think about the kind of suffering Jesus went, and you ask, it's so small, it's not even worth mentioning. Because you are looking at it in the light of heaven. So this idea of having an eternal perspective is very, very important. And it will help you to concentrate on what matters. And it will motivate you to put your, your, your diligence, working hard on it. And it is going to excite you, not just at the end, but in the process when you realize you are serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes, the songwriter will write. Put your eyes on Jesus. Look fully at his face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his grace, glory and grace. So what is verse 22 saying? If I am to go on living in the body, Paul says, this will mean fruitful labor for me. What for, why fruitful labor? He has already said it. Because people will get to know Jesus. Because the lost will find Jesus. So he's saying, living means evangelism. For me to live is Christ. It means I'm looking at my life in terms of heaven. Heaven will be populated because I lived a long life. But if truth be told, if I died young, I will gain no more struggles. I am I will rest with the God. So everything has to be seen with the eternal perspective. So Paul is saying, let's be frank, I don't know what to choose. I desire to depart, oh, to be with the Lord, to rest in heaven, to enjoy eternal Sabbath. That's fantastic. But then, if I do that, then I, 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 there are places I will not be able to, to preach, like for him. He wanted to preach all over Europe and go to Spain. And that will not happen. So he says, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with the Lord, which is, by, which is better by far. Resting and being with the Lord is by far better. But if I remain alive, then I'll have fruitful labor. My friend, if you want biblical success, you must see everything from a godly perspective. You must see it. Always ask, how would God look at this same thing? And therefore, you do what is important as seen in heaven. You have the right perspective because you see it long term. You don't act on short term gains. And sometimes, Short-term gains can make you lose long-term. Because you, are, you enjoyed it for a while, but it messed you up. You enjoyed it for a while, then you got HIV AIDS. You enjoyed it for a while, then it spoiled your, 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 your name. And from then onwards, you are unable to cope. That's how David suffered. One night with Bathsheba, and the rest of his life was never the same. So look at things long term, not short term. And it will help you to direct your efforts in the right direction and therefore to be a success long term. May the Lord truly help us to 
understand and live in this way that honors God.